Uh, we'll make a presentation that's fairly simple, just present a couple of, couple of things uh, with no intention to theorize uh, it. I have a few images. The first one is a non-image. This could be called a tale of two painters if uh, in one city, New York. Um, New York has, and, and it's about um, Morocco and New York. Uh, New York has not traditionally been a destination for Moroccan artists. There have been very few examples. Um, I will focus on two of them because I think they are significant, because they have had very different lives and a very different kind of output, and because they each have one work in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, um, which happen to be the only 20th century Moroccan works, I believe, in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Um, the two artists are Mohamed Melehi and Ahmed Yaqoubi. Uh, Melehi is considered one of the most important Moroccan artists uh, or North African artists ever. Uh, Yaqoubi definitely has his champions, but is a somewhat more forgotten figure, let's say. It does not have a clear or stable place in the art historical canon. Um, this is uh, Mlihi. This is a recent picture. Uh, this was taken uh, during preparations for a um, retrospective of his work that's taken place um, in Morocco recently. He also has a, a solo exhibition in London right now, uh, curated by Murad Montazami, which is his first solo exhibition in the UK. So it's a kind of case of recognition late internationally, but, but still. He was born in 1936. He uh, studied in Tetuan, in Sevilla, in Rome, and then he got a Rockefeller Fellowship to come spend two years in the US in 19, from 1962 to 1964. Um, the, I sh I'm showing you this picture because the work he is holding, this poster, is the work of his that is in the collection of, of the museum. Um, it's a poster of an exhibition, a three artists exhibition that took place in Rabat in 1966, and he designed the poster. Uh, it's Melehi, Bilkahia, and Shaba. Uh, and he, he did a lot of poster design, and, and uh, you recognize the, the circle here and the kind of calligraphy also in the covers of the magazine Souffle that he used to, to design as well. This work, the poster, was included in only uh, one, in one exhibition at MoMA in 1968, it was entitled Word and Image, Posters and Typography from a Graphic Design Collection of the Museum of Modern Art, 1879-1967. And uh, Shaba, Melehi, and Bilkahia was a trio that became known as the Casablanca School later. Uh, they were not from Casablanca, but Casablanca is where they were active as a group and with others uh, between the mid-60s and the mid-70s. Um, I should say, for those who don't know, that Morocco gained independence from, Fra from France and Spain in 1956, when these artists were all about 20 years old. And um, so they had their initial education under colonialism and then became active as artists in an independent country. Uh, with writers, filmmakers, and others, they started magazines and movements such as, as this one. Um, and they, the point of these movements was as they, in their own terms, to achieve a cultural decolonization after the kind of formal independence was achieved but didn't, didn't go far, that without this kind of cultural decolonization, um, the formal independence was moot. So I'll go to, I'll skip over this and go to his US stay. Um, Melehi first spent a few months teaching in Minnesota and then came to New York for about a year and a half. In the first year, he shared a studio on 2nd Avenue and 4th Street with Lucio Pozzi, an artist whom he had known in Rome. And then when his, Melehi's partner, uh, Tony Maraini, came from Rome to join him, he moved to Rivington Street. His New York period is not very well studied. There are two things that are told, the two statements that come back often. One is that in New York, he had an encounter with hard edge abstraction, hard-edge painting, and that that influenced his work forever. The second thing is that, the thing, second thing that gets repeated is that he participated in an exhibition at MoMA in 1963 that was titled Hard Edge and Geometric Painting and Sculpture. And that, that was proof that he was fully immersed in the New York art life. So I'd like to briefly qualify these two facts. Um, 
so about the first fact, the, the hard edge, um, and I can show you some pictures. So these are paintings he made while he was, he was here. So here you see a kind of grid type structure. And then he, Mlihi is very much known for, the, for work like this, this motif of the, of the wave, the wave and the flame that has kind of permeated his work for decades now. And, you could, and in fact, the, this wave started appearing in some of the work he was doing uh, in New York, interestingly, as a kind of a move away from, from the grid, maybe, that was more prevalent. Um, but Lucio Pozzi, who was sharing a studio with him, says, at one point, to during the stay in New York, at one point, Milehi returned home for a working vacation and took a trip, a field trip, in southern Morocco to trace and study pre-Islamic art. He also photographed certain geometric designs he found painted on the ceilings of buildings in the Atlas Mountains. He and a few colleagues collected and studied Berber carpets and any other forms of art which they could trace the ancient Moroccan culture. And Malihi says, I needed to conduct that research in southern Morocco because I had to clear myself of the anachronistic influence of Greco-Latin culture imposed on Moroccan artists by local art schools structured after European idealistic models. Um, so there's this interesting um, conjunction of uh, a kind of an influence from New York that then gets this, this triangulation of uh, traditional culture at the same time as the hard edge abstraction. It's hard to see, to say exactly where the influences are, but in any case, it seems to be a less, um, a less linear trajectory, a less linear New York to Casablanca influence than um, what has often been said. Um, In a way, it's almost as though New York helped. New York, in a sense, uh, marks um, a transitional moment in his trajectory. So in 64, after the Rockefeller grant, he doesn't try to stay here. He returns to Morocco immediately, and he, uh, he lives there ever since. In a way, New York perhaps was a transition between the kind of spaces like Rome, Paris, Seville, where he lived, that were maybe more marked by a kind of the, what colonialism in Morocco was about. So this was kind of a distance that allowed him to return to Morocco afterwards. In a, in a way, New York helped him, New York helped make New York irrelevant for Malihi in some way. Because if you look at his travels and exhibitions afterwards, you find Mexico City, Algiers, Dakar, Kuwait, Baghdad, but very little uh, New York, for instance. Um, it, Um, he, so he says, in 1967, I discovered that one cannot import modernism. The rehabilitation of our own values was more vital and more urgent. And for me, modernism is situated precisely in this rehabilitation. Some people have called this vernacular modernism. Um, so this had to do with the salvaging and reappropriation of one's visual culture or repertoire, as I was saying, a kind of saving tradition from its folklorization uh, uh, that had happened under colonialism, defreezing it in some way. And this involved pedagogy as well. He and Belkahia and Milihi all taught at the Casablanca, at School of Fine Arts in Casablanca, where they revamped the curriculum entirely. The, the second point about the hard edge and geometric abstraction show here at MoMA, um, I tried to look for this show. Um, and it does exist, but not in the way that one might think. It was an exhibition that was not totally public. Uh, it was organized by a department called the Art Lending Service. Uh, it was uh, in a space that was reserved for, so the Art Lending Service was a service that worked in um, partnership with a number of galleries in New York and maybe also outside New York, where um, works were shown here, were lent and could be sold, basically. And so there was a curator and they made these exhibitions, but they weren't really part of the official MoMA program in a way. So it was kind of a hard edge hidden hard edge abstraction uh, that he was part of, let's say. Um, we have to go fast because maybe I'm already at the end of my time. Anyway, I'll, I'll go to Yaqubi. Ahmed Yaqubi, uh, this is him with Francis Bacon in Tangier, 1950.
56. He was um, more or less 28 years old. We don't know his exact birth date. And at that age, he already had had a number of exhibitions in several countries, including Ceylon, Hong Kong, Spain, and the US. Um, he, to go very quickly, he, so he lived in Tangier um, starting age 20. It was through and thanks and with uh, Jane and Paul Bowles, who had a kind of a central role in his life for a certain period of time. Um, and they met him when he was 20 years old in Fez. And Paul Bowles, who had just moved to Morocco and wanted to learn Moroccan Arabic, was learning from him, among other people. And when Yaqubi wasn't able to understand a word, he would start making drawings. And those drawings were apparently extremely impressive drawings, not, not very simple drawings to explain a word. So the Bowles started encouraging him to do more, bought him painting materials, um, and got him contacts with people, uh, basically. And I will read just some excerpts of correspondence. Um, he says that he had always done drawings in ch since childhood, but the Jane Bowles encouraged him to go to painting. And he had trouble figuring out oil paint because he had never had an art education. He had actually never been to school at all um, because his father um, didn't want his son to learn anything from the French, who were the colonizers then. So the best way to do that was just to not go to school. And it's uh, very effective. <laughs> And um, Francis Bacon, who at a certain time was going to Tangier a lot, let him watch him in his studio. So he figured out how to use oil paint by watching Francis Bacon. And Bacon never let anyone in his studio. So that was kind of an interesting fact. Same thing with uh, Yaqubi. He has one work in the MoMA collection, King Solomon's Ring. It's from 1963. It is an oil painting. It was shown in the museum once in a show simply titled recent acquisitions. You can see it over there. Um, and in April 1966, and has remained in storage ever since. This is 53 years. Um, it had just been donated to the museum by Mrs. Raymond J. Braun and David Mann. David Mann was the director of the Bodley Gallery, which was owned by Mr. and Mrs. Braun. And, and they had, the, the gallery showed Max Ernst, Roberto Mata, and many others. Jacobi had the solo show there in January 66, and so the, I guess the painting was donated right then and exhibit, exhibited right then. Um, just a couple other words of his, works of his. It's, it's very hard to find good reproductions of them. There are not a lot of his works um, around. Uh, quickly, that 1966 exhibition was not his first show in New York. He had had several. The first one was at the Betty Parsons Gallery in 1952, so he was in his 20s. And this happened through uh, Paul Bowles' contact. I, I'll read you a couple of things briefly. The first letter from Bowles to Betty Parsons in 51. It's a question of a young Arab painter from Fez whose progress I've been watching since December 47. I think he's astonishingly gifted, a natural abstractionist. But the sureness of his sense of balance of line and color is admirable, and the oneness his work makes with the rest of contemporary painting, although he has never seen any, is amazing. He claims the subject matter is all derivative of Moroccan legends and Islamic folklore, but one would never know it. Betty Parsons answers, your Arab painter sounds fascinating. You know, send me pictures, etc." And then um, Yaqubi, who's traveling in India, in Bangalore, with, um, with uh, Bowles, sends Betty Parsons a letter. So he, he dictates to Bowles, who translates from Moroccan Arabic. It's a long letter, and he tells her all the stories that are behind the paintings or the drawings that he's sending. And I'll just read the last paragraph after he tells the stories. He says, now I'm working on all the gods of the Hindus, and I'd love to see those works. They have snakes, monkeys, and elephants for gods. One man from Delhi says, I can have an exhibition in Delhi. All the pictures you have in New York have many stories. If Allah wills, wills it, I shall go to New York someday and tell you the stories so you can know them. I am very happy you are having the exhibition in New York, and I hope many people will see the pictures. In Fez, no one knows I make pictures. I have never had a master. But when I was small, my head was always full of stories of things that happened long ago and things that happened to people in Fez, how people met devils and jnoons, and I liked to make pictures of them. When I was 13 years old, I knew all the stories, and when I was 16, I drew pictures of them. 
And when I was 17, I painted them. And when I was 20 minus six months, I had an ex exhibition in Tangier. And when I am 20, I shall have an exhibition in New York, if Allah wills it. And when I am 21 in Lisbon, if Allah wills it, I greet your family. If Allah wills it, I shall write you a letter from Ceylon. Um, so the exhibition goes on. Uh, there is some press. Uh, there is an issue that happens, which is that um, Betty Parsons writes Paul Bowles to say that uh, Du Buffet, who was in New York and saw the exhibition, thinks that uh, this guy, so I should, that, um, yeah, this was the, the um, how do you call it, the little advertisement. So he didn't have a last name in this exhibition. He was called Ahmed. <laughs> Ahmed, young, 20-year-old Moroccan, exhibits at Betty Parsons. The press articles also say this, you know, Ahmed is gifted, Ahmed does this, Ahmed does that. It's like, it's really interesting. Also, the, the, between the first letter and the exhibition was three months. It was, all happened very quickly. But uh, Bowles says, I am particularly annoyed by the fact that Du Buffet should take it upon himself to say that because he has been in Africa and seen what Arabs do in the way of drawing and painting, Ahmed's things could therefore not possibly be authentic because they don't look like the others. Um, let's see. I guess I should finish, right? Okay, I will try and, and finish quickly. I'll just give you, um, um, uh, Ahmed's reaction to this. Um, no, I won't. <laughs> it's hilarious and I'll tell you if you ask me afterwards. Um, but it involves tor a virtual torture of Du Buffet. Um, in any case, so this exhibition happens he, Ahmed um, Yaqubi, doesn't actually see it himself. He is able to come for another exhibition of his work a year later, and he kind of, through these contacts with the Bowles and the Parsons and all of that, ends up in kind of New York high society, going to all these dinners. As Bowles says, living in sin with the actress Libby Holman for three months, but then she ends up dumping him. And so there's all these incredible, strange stories that happen to this guy who is supposed to be illiterate. But as you saw in the letter about, you know, next year I'll have an exhibition here and have an exhibition there, it's, it's maybe not as easy as they make it sound. It's maybe not just this innocent uh, guy or this uh, dream of un unspoiled childhood kind of making pictures. Um, at, at the same time, he has to, he leaves New York and then he will return um, later to settle in New York for good in 1966. So most of the rest of his life was spent here. They, those were much more quiet and stable years. He was not in touch so much with Bowles anymore. He meets Ellen Stewart, who ran the La Mama uh, Gallery and Theater here, who gave him a loft space. Um, he met in the 70s his partner, Carol Cannon, uh, who was with him until he dies. And those years were much calmer, but also in terms of production and circulation of the work, and he ends up being a bit um, forgotten. So I'll, I'll just conclude um, um, or wrap up. Um, so Malihi came as part of a process of learning to New York. He was approaching the art world from the inside in a way, from a point of view of someone who went to art school, had an understanding of how galleries and museums and art schools function. But he soon realized his calling was, else, was elsewhere, was back home, that his mission was to go and contribute to building what he called a national culture, and that this process of building a national culture needed to be collective and needed to start with a rescue operation, a recovery of oneself, which meant the study and revival of traditional vernacular heritage. Interestingly, Ahmed Yaqubi seemed to, in some ways, effortlessly embody that something of that creative vernacular heritage. He hadn't had the separation of schooling in some way that um, some um, writers in Morocco, I'm thinking of Ahmed Bouanani, theorized as not that, that as illiterization, sort of you're not illiterate because you haven't been to school. In fact, when you grew up under colonialism, you were illiterate because you had been to school, because you were separated from uh, a, 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 what he called an ancestral capacity of reading the signs of your culture and the nature around you as well. 
So Yaqubi did not go to colonial school. In a way, he was never cut from that ancestral capacity. He brought it with him to New York. He came laden with a culture that he was giving visual shape to in very singular ways. He enjoyed that society life and all of that, but he was not particularly interested in conforming to the model of the museum, the gallery, the art school. And as such, he was embraced immediately, but only as a curiosity or a wonder, as a force of life or seduction, as an exotic singular talent, but he was embraced briefly. New York always needs to renew its stocks of excitement, and there's always more exoticism knocking at the door. Um, and he, what, so there's very little trace left of uh, Yaqubi. Buenani, um, not Buenani, Milihi came back for a retrospective show of his work at the Bronx Museum in 85, which interestingly is also the year that, that Yaqubi died in New York, forgotten. And there are very few material traces of Yaqubi. One of them is so some texts that were translated, uh, one here translated by Bowles in the nice company of Burroughs and Mayakovsky and Octavio Paz and Vicente Huidobro and all of that, uh, with comments by Burroughs on his own text. And, uh, and this, which is a uh, curiosity, uh, the Alchemist's Cookbook, Moroccan Scientific Cuisine by Ahmed Yaqubi, if you want to see it. It includes the hashish harira and uh, a few other things. I'm not sure how this happened, and but... A and what? A and, and a soup to cure jealousy, absolutely. <laughs> Among many, many other things, including if you're 64, this dish will make you younger. So if anyone is 64 in the room, <laughs> Um, you can come look at this. Thank you.